Um, I'm going to talk about uh, being an author for the AAS journals and a little bit about changes in the AAS journals um, in terms of the submission process for authors. Much of what I'm going to say is applicable broadly to other journals which we will not be discussing here. Um, the AAS journals are, of course, the journals of this society and of our community, and so I am unapologetically um, a booster of them. Besides, they pay my salary. So um, I'm going to talk about writing a paper for the journals and what it takes to write a paper. When people sit down and try to decide whether or not they're ready to write a paper, we all of us are driven by things um, that are not part of the scientific process. And this applies especially to people at the beginning of their careers who have deadlines to make, um, goals to accomplish before they can proceed. So um, that's not really something the journals worry about. We worry about what you send in. So we'd like you to consider the following things before you start writing the research paper. Um, the first and most important is, do you have original results to communicate to your peers? I'm a theorist, and I know that as people do projects, they absorb a lot of knowledge about what's going on on a particular topic. And this knowledge uh, can seem very impressive to you because you've learned a tremendous amount. It's not always clear when what you've contributed to that amounts to enough to write a paper. Um, so think about that. Ask your advisor, your colleagues. Uh, the format of the article. Um, when you start out, this is all kind of alien to you. As you proceed, it becomes more or less routine. But you should make sure you know what you're going to be writing and what references you want to use. Um, what journal are you submitting to? We're simplifying this for the AAS journals so that uh, the requirements and the submission procedures are going to be unified and as streamlined as we can make them. And you should understand what it's going to take to publish the paper in terms of little things that are not part of the scientific procedure, but things like getting permission for figures. So all of this is a matter of planning. And that means you have to figure out what story you're trying to tell in the paper and what should be part of that story and what doesn't really have to be part of the story, even though it's on your mind and seems relevant to you. Most people write outlines before they proceed to write the articles. Some of us just kind of dive in. I can't really recommend one or the other. Um, on a, I'm told conventional wisdom is you should write an outline. I just start talking or writing and see where it goes. Um, I have to say I do a lot of rewriting. So maybe an outline is the best thing. Um, when you decide to submit your article, you're already a bit late on one important part of it, which is which journal are you sending it into? And that's something you should actually have in mind from the very beginning of the writing process. The astrophysical journal and the astronomical journal have a good deal of overlap in subject material, um, but they are somewhat distinct in terms of what they cover, in terms of the internal culture, and you should think about which one of them is actually a good fit for your article, and you should write to that. And of course, if you're writing a letter, a letter is typically shorter, a summary um, frequently of more important research. Um, but even if, you, um, even if you're submitting an unusually long letter, uh, it still is something that is presented differently from a main journal article. And you should have that voice inside of you as you're writing that reminds you of that. So what you need to do is be ready to report something that's a major new advance or a new approach to a topic, um, a new instrument, a new software um, approach to a long-standing problem. You need to set it in the context of other people's work. You're part of a community. You're communicating with your fellow researchers. You're presenting work which did not spring uh, out of nothing, ex nihilo. Um, your child is actually a part of a process that involves the whole community. And you should be careful to set it into context, both as a matter of intellectual integrity, um, as a matter of explaining to the reader what's going on, 
uh, and let's be honest, giving credit to your peers so that they don't try to kill you. Um, not that that's ever happened, but, whoops, I went too far. Um, so, um, you should do an exhaustive search of the literature on this topic. It's uh, not usual for me as an editor to receive a paper, look through ADS for possible referees, and find a paper that covers almost exactly the same ground that's not on the reference list, but it's not unheard of either. And these are people I'd likely to be asked to do a review, um, and they might be a little upset. <laughs> so <laughs> be careful about this. What constitutes a significant advance? That's a time-dependent thing. The first exoplanet was an amazing advance. The 100th exoplanet was interesting. The 5,000th exoplanet is routine, unless there's some very distinguishing thing about it. So um, you have to decide what meets a reasonable criteria for uh, a new significant advance. And you can't always rely on history. It's something that changes with time. Also true of purely theoretical work. Um, it fits in a context. It may overlap with previous work. It may oppose someone's recently proposed work. Um, it may be a support for someone else's work. So you need to figure all this out. If you write an outline, you should know as you're set pen to paper or whatever it is people do these days, um, you know what your topic is, why it's important, how to explain how it's related to the other work in the field, what's original about what you've done, and that should be very clearly spelled out at every step. Who are the authors? Most papers we get have several authors these days. A single author paper is rare. Um, people have contributed to the work besides you. Some of them deserve an acknowledgement. Some of them are your co-authors. So you start with the outline. You set up a, generally speaking, something that follows this. Oh, this has some impronounceable um, IMRAD. Huh, OK. <laughs> Where'd the final C go to? Um, there's a set format for how we present results um, in science. The introduction, the methods, the results, the discussion, the conclusions. And readers and editors will expect you to follow it. And if you do not follow it, uh, it presents obstacles to understanding what the hell you've done. I mean, sorry, what you've done. <laughs> um, who is your audience? A typical neophyte mistake is that you address your paper to the people who were sitting beside you as you did all your research. Uh, it's rarely a good idea. You're speaking to a somewhat broader audience than that. You would like to be able to speak to as broad a professional audience as possible. And that means you have to explain things in a way that you've absorbed in the course of doing this project. It's just instinctively the way you think about it. You have to go back and explain it at length, which means you should avoid using technical phrases that you've gotten used to, but other people probably haven't. At the very least, you should introduce them. Uh, you should be careful about what you say. If, for example, you conceive your work as being part of a grand speculative project that no one else believes in besides you, then you, you will cast doubt in people's minds on the work that you've done by trying to tie it too closely to this grand structure. You build structures, scientific theory and it's in progress, one brick at a time, and you want people to understand that what you're setting in place is one brick. And you may have a distant goal, a speculative goal. It's okay to mention it very briefly, but you shouldn't give people the idea that if they don't think that goal is worthy, then nothing you're setting out in this article is worth paying attention to. It should be as short as possible, and not too short. So obviously, um, that's not a rule that you can live with immediately. Um, it's probably good for you all to know that a typical scientific paper uh, prints out 
at about average 12 pages. There are some much longer. There are some that are shorter. But you have to develop a taste for this. The sections of your article, spelled out here in somewhat greater length. The first part, the title and the abstract, is in some ways the most important. It's the most important because it's the most visible. We all read many more titles and abstracts than we do papers. And you want it to stick in people's minds, not because it's bizarre, but because there's a little hook which reminds them that there was a paper on this particular topic that made this particular claim. So it's a very short summary of what the paper is about. It should draw a reader in, especially if the paper is of interest um, to their own work. Um, it shouldn't promise more than it's going to deliver. It should not be too vague. And there's no hook, and people won't remember it. Um, these days, especially if you search the literature, what that really means is you go to ADS and you enter some words that should appear in the abstract. So other people are going to do that for your article. You want to make sure that the people who should find it do find it. There's a very small niche for clever or funny titles. Um, it's a very small niche. <laughs> Mostly, you shouldn't do it. Every now and then, there's something too good to pass up. But it's a distraction from the main purpose of the title, which is to be informative. And um, if it's a good joke, it may not be informative. So keep that in mind. Um, oh, I forgot. I've been updating this. And I see at the bottom in here that it says, most journals do not allow references in the abstract. Um, sometimes an abstract really should contain a brief mention of some previous paper. It's just very unnatural not to mention it if this paper builds on another earlier paper. Um, so we do allow that kind of reference as an unusual but acceptable thing. Um, there's no single format for an abstract. It's a summary of your work. Think carefully about what a summary would look like. So here's some examples of titles. Um, you know, they give, if it's about an object, they give the object name. Um, if it's about a class, it delineates the class. There's no theory titles in here. I should have done something about that. Um, is this readable? It seemed a bit fuzzy on my screen. Um, so here's a, a typical observational abstract. Uh, published in some negligible journal. Um, it, it tells what was the goal of the observation, what was done to get it, um, why it's important, all in just a few sentences, and then it moves on. The introduction. The point of the introduction is to explain, explain to people what the problem is and why you're interested in it and put it in the context of other work in the field. Some of that other work may have been done wrong, in, in your opinion, maybe really wrong. But if it's part of the literature, you should mention it. Because even wrong work is part of the context of your work. If it's done by a hated rival, well, you know, tough. <laughs> Still mention it. Um, so, the goals of your study, why you're pursuing it, what you're pursuing, how you're going to go about it, what's the background and context. Some of the worst introductions I've ever read are nice summaries of a field that leave one totally baffled as to what the paper is going to add. And um, frequently, when they're reviewed, the reviewer can't figure out what's been added. Okay. Somewhere in the course of the introduction, you have to explain what you're adding to the stack here. If you disagree with previous work, 
you should be forthright about it. If you agree with previous work, you should give credit where credit is due. You should not be repeating your own words. You should not be repeating the words of others. Often when people accuse someone else of plagiarism in our field, it's because they feel their ideas were lifted by that attribution. That's wrong. Um, it happens less often than accusations fly. Um, but it's also true that the specific words that are used by someone should not be copied out in your own paper um, unless it's absolutely necessary for some reason. OK. Um, the literature of our field is vast. You can't possibly give a reference to everything that's vaguely relevant in the introduction. So you have to pick and choose. You should mention the seminal paper in the area. You should mention the most recent significant papers in the area. And you should do so as near as you can in a way that's fair. Um, and ignores your personal feuds, your personal rivalries. Um, you should reference your ex-spouse if you have to. Um, you know, you just, this is just professional ethics. Um, it's always handy to reference a recent inclusive review article that doesn't relieve you of the burden of mentioning the first significant papers in an area, but it can take care of the problem of what out of the vast literature you pick out as part of the background of your own work. A good introduction is not too long. Uh, we still talk about pages, even though, literally speaking, there are no such things. Um, if you print something out, an introduction that's a good introduction should only be a couple of pages. You're not trying to write a text on the topic. There are different kinds of papers we write in our field. In fact, more varieties than are listed here. Um, broadly speaking, we divide papers in astronomy and astrophysics into theory and observation. But of course, that's not quite true. There are simulations, which are kind of like theory. And there are ex laboratory experiments, which are kind of like observations. And there are instrumental papers, which are even less like observations, but not at all like theory. Um, so. Each of these calls for a somewhat different approach to um, writing a paper. Um, in theory, in computation, you want to stress your theoretical methods, the formalism, the mathematics. Um, computers, it's the software. Um, if you're writing software preceding papers about algorithms, you need to be able to give enough information that someone can, who's an expert in the field can really understand exactly what you've done, and someone who's not knows where to look for the information. Um, in the case of observational and experimental work, um, well, if you're taking observations, you need to describe your equipment, your, the algorithms you use to reduce the data, and so on. Um, well, OK. Um, I think this is relatively clear, and I don't have a lot of time here. Um, let me push on to results and discussions. When you t give your results, it's usually not enough just to cite numbers, right? You want to place your results in as much context as you can. Sometimes that's not much. Um, sometimes there's quite a lot. You want to present it in a way that makes it retrievable for someone who's looking at the same objects again or using similar methodology again on some other object. Um, you want to explain why, what your results have done for the problem you set out to solve, what implications they have for the field. And you want to do so in a way that clearly delineates what you've done with what was available to the field before you started writing mm -hmm. your paper. So. Again, something of a matter of taste, you know it when you see it, but um, it's a very bad thing when you sort of end the section with saying, oh, well, all right, these are the numbers, or 
this is what my last equation looks like, or something like this. Um, that's not actually useful to the field. What's useful to the field is that you show your results as part of a solution to the problem you set out to solve, or an explanation of why you couldn't get quite to that solution, but here's how far you got. Um, and if you're baffled, it's okay to say you're baffled. Scientists are baffled is one of the most common headlines in all newspapers. Um, they might exaggerate it a bit, but it's okay to be honest. Um, interpreting your results, there's a lot of care one has to take. Um, so whether you're doing theory or experiment, you often go in with a strong idea of what you're going to see. And if you see it, that may or may not be support for the whole theoretical prejudices that you bring to the project. Um, it might be that you could have seen those results under a number of different models or hypotheses about what's going on. And you should be careful and honest about that. Um, so this was, involves some introspection. You've seen something, it's consistent or it's inconsistent with your original ideas. It doesn't usually prove your original ideas even if it's consistent with them. It's a step toward a better understanding. And be careful how you say it. Um, again, for theory, um, you have the burden of showing what the next step might be in exploring a theoretical notion or applying a methodology. Um, and you should, it's okay at this point to be a little forward thinking, a little speculative, but not enormously so. Future research plans um, should not be spelled out in great and gory detail. You want to pursue this topic. You've learned some things that will help you. It's OK to say, I plan to extend this to this and that. Um, you should not start listing all the ways in which you might do that extension. That's really for the next paper. Um, similarly, for observational work, Let me just say, for the conclusion of your article, the conclusion is the bookend to the abstract. You're explaining at greater length than in the abstract what it is you've found, what you've learned from it, what the reader should take away. Um, it's not a single paragraph. It has references, but it's um, the thing that if you flip to it, if you're a casual reader, you will walk away with a fairly strong idea of what claims the paper is made and where you've ended up at the end of the day. Um, references. Um, it shouldn't be excessive, but you need to hit all the significant ones. You need to include your enemies in your reference list as well as your friends. Um, you can favor your friends, of course, but you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, just a pet peeve of mine. If you submit a paper that's been referenced for some other journal, I will get this funny feeling that either you're very careless or you've just been rejected by the other journal and you couldn't be bothered to rewrite the reference list. It doesn't make a good impression. Take the time. Do the reference list according to our style. Um, and thank everyone you should thank, people who've provided funding, um, people who provided uh, substantial assistance, equipment, expertise, facilities. Probably not your dog. My dog's important to me. Your dog's important to you. But their emotional support actually did not, should not end up in the acknowledgments. You should have explicit approval from all your co-authors. Do I really have to say this? I know I do, because we get submissions from people who have sort of forgotten to mention to their co-authors that they're submitting a paper with their name on it. Um, that is not a favor. That's bad. OK? Um, if your name is on a paper, you should have a chance to say, we need to change something. I don't like this part of it. Or please take my name off. 
and you're part of a group, you better be sure that your group knows that you're doing it, that you have followed all the internal procedures of your group. Um, if you use someone else's figures, you better have explicit permission. This is not just a copyright, but also a courtesy issue. Um, we have publication charges. You should know who's going to pay them. We do grant occasional waivers, but it should be part of the planning. Um, we give instructions for authors on our website. Please look at them. Sign a copyright form. Make sure there's someone else that can be contacted if you are run over by a bus or you go into labor or something, you know, right, when you should be responding to questions about the paper. Um, we have ethics standards. They're on our website. They repeat many of these points. They make a few others. Um, I don't have time to go through them all, but we expect you to adhere to them. Um, we regard them as more than just reasonable expectations. They're spelled out at this website. You can find it just by searching for ethics and AAS. We are very lenient about copyright. You submit to us, you sign a copyright form, but if you then turn around and post your version of your paper, not the copy edited formatted one, but the version that was the final version, you can post that on AstroPH, your private website, whatever. That's fine. 